the professor Lisa. Yeah. So there will be a silence for two minutes now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I no. like so I, I put the date on my slide November 10th or the 11th. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> it's perfect. Yes. <laughs> uh, but Professor Lim, thanks for correcting that summer time zone. If if or not, it will be disaster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Would have missed it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because in Korea we don't have a summer time thing, so we didn't have a, a time zone shift. But yeah, this, always this particular week where the time changes is always yeah uh, always a problem with meetings. That we had a Siam committee meeting today where somebody was yeah. ca calling in from Hong Kong, but right. didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm you know circadian club uh, biology community, and yesterday our president announced the uh, uh, that uh, time uh, the time zone uh, the summertime uh, zone ch uh, summertime change is very uh, not good for our health <laughs> circadian rhythm. So hopefully that policy changes soon. Maybe yeah, you have to write a lot of papers on that. Actually, so already there are many paper about the uh, bad thing of that uh, policy for our circadian rhythm and sleep wake up cycle. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah. I think I don't know the history of it. I thought it was uh, done for the far farmers mm -hmm. so that there would be more daylight. I see. I see. But I, it might I, I could, yeah, it could be. Yeah, it could be good for vegetable, but not for us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, it's time. So let's begin uh, today's Biomax Colloquium. Uh, everyone, thanks for coming again. So uh, actually next week and uh, follow next week, we also have a great speaker, so please join. So usually I introduce the speaker, but today we have a, a Professor Lim uh, who is a good friend of the Professor Lisa. So I'm very sure that she can introduce way better than me. So I asked her to introduce the Professor Lisa. So let's welcome the Professor Sun Nim. Okay, thank you. Okay, <laughs> okay it is, uh, so it is my great pleasure to introduce doc Dr. Lisa Fauch, who is speaking today. So Lisa is, um, as many of you know, she's a world famous researcher who solves many important and interesting problems in biological fluid dynamics. She has given many plenary talks at international conferences and national research institute throughout the world. And I'm so proud to be her academic sister. <laughs> okay, so to give you some information about her academic career, she did um, receive her PhD at Kuran Institute, New York University. Uh, in 1986, and she joined the faculty of Tulane University in the same year. Mm -hmm. She is currently a Pendergraft Nola Lee Highness Professor in Mathematics, it's a long name, <laughs> Professor in Mathematics at Tulane University. Um, I guess many of you already know that she became a fellow of many uh, societies, such as SIAM, American Physical Society, American Mathematical Society. And she was selected as Sonia Kovalevsky lecturer by Association for Women in Mathematics in 2018. Uh -huh. And she also served as a SIAM president from two, wow. 2019 to 2020. <laughs> I believe many of you saw her uh, at Valencia, uh, yeah. Spain <laughs> at uh, IKEA meeting back in 2019. She was there as a SIAM president. So, okay, this is a brief history. She, she has done so many things. I, I don't think I can um, list all of her work <laughs> in terms of researching and education and everything. So this is a brief history of her career. So now I'll, um, she will talk about one of her research work, which I'm really excited to hear today. And the title is Biofluid Dynamics of Reproduction. Cool. Okay, Thank let's you. welcome our yeah, speaker, thanks. Lisa. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Suk, for that kind introduction. I'm very proud to be your big sister. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, I actually I wanted... you're my uh, uh, actually Danny Forger is my uh, advisor. Yeah. So... Oh yeah, Taeyeon oh, is our okay. academic nephew. So you're my nephew. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy. There's a big. Uh, I, I have a I have a Korean family. I, I yeah. know. 
Yeah, so uh, here you have a lot of your grandchildren's here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, Lisa, so oh, Lisa, is is yeah. that okay to um, interrupt your um, please speech? Uh, if they have questions, they can ask. Yeah, please. Uh, okay. I, I would okay. like that because I, I I know there's not that many people, and this is informal, and so um, please inter please ask me questions if you want. So I, um, I, when I, I, I gave you this title a while back and, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit just about a piece of reproduction and I, because I also wanted to have some time to, to show you some things that I'm working on now. So, um, so here, uh, the, here are some of the collaborators on the projects that I'm gonna, going to show some pictures are old and some some are not and then I, I'm also going to so, so I, I just want to highlight that most of the work that I'm going to show you is done by fabulous students and postdocs mm -hmm. and so I will try to call them out when I um, when I can uh, so you uh, know like Sook I work on problems in biological fluid dynamics and uh, What's interesting about biological fluid dynamics is, the, is, is that the, the structure that one studies is moving along with the fluid. It's a fully coupled system. You, the, the, the words fluid structure interaction is, has become a, 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 nor, a, a common phrase in engineering. And if you're looking to see systems where the motion of the fluid interacts with the shape evolution of a structure, there's no better place to look than in fluid dynamics. And so I, let's go this way. So I, I usually, I, I like to show this image to people because most mathematicians don't really understand where fertilization occurs and where, where's all the interesting, uh, you know, uh, ingredients of fluid dynamics. So sperm enter here, then they go through, 10% uh, of the sperm that enter here go through the cervix into the uterus, into, through, and, and they have to pass through very complex fluids with polymeric structures. Then they make their way through the uterus and, uh, and up into the fallopian tubes or the oviduct. So most mathematicians don't know where fertilization actually occurs. Fertilization, actually occurs up around this or up around here. Mm -hmm. So an egg is released from the, uh, from the ovary mm -hmm. and the sperm ha uh, meets the egg up around here. And how does the, the sperm get there? It goes through a very tortuous environment. And the tube here itself is undergoing muscular contractions. There's also cilia. In, in, in the last decades, cilia um, have been found everywhere in the uterus, in the, in the oviduct. So the sperm is motile. It makes its way up through where it meets the egg and the, the sperm egg penetration. But then the egg has to, the fertilized egg has to get back and be implanted into the uterus. Mm -hmm. And so once the egg is fertilized, it is passive. It doesn't have that motor of the sperm flagellum. And so how does it get back down here? Uh, there's, there's peristaltic contractions, there's cilia beating that, uh, that, uh, that cause a background flow and so forth. So there's my, my very quick uh, introduction to mammalian uh, fertilization. Is so- Is there any difference between left and right? No, well, uh, you know, that's, that's, there is a, is there a difference between left and right? I, I don't think that there's a, a fund, there's probably regular anatomical variation, but I don't, I, I, I use, usually uh, whichever side is ovulating takes turn one month here, one month there. And there are some statistics on that. It's not always, mm -hmm. but something that's actually interesting, it was found that, um, so, so, so all, all the sperm come through and then they go to either side, but it was uh, noticed that there are more sperm going towards the side where, where ovulation occurs. So there's some idea that there's short range, uh, 
that maybe the sperm is actually um, chemotactic towards the egg. But something that's pretty that, that there was a, there was an experiment, you know, maybe 20 years ago, uh -huh. uh, where and, and this this w is an experiment that most that would not have been done, I guess, in the U.S. But I can't remember where it was done. That there were women volunteers who uh, who they they injected. Um, like uh, colloid spheres into the into the reproductive tract, which were not modal at all, and then they saw where those spheres ended up, and and so there was no swimming there, and and most of them ended up in the in the statistically more in the side that was ovulating, so that tells you that there's some female uh, mediated. Um, Maybe it's it's muscular contractions or ciliary beats. That's you know it's it's not just the sperm who knows where he wants to go. The female reproductive tract was pushing things in that direction. Anyway, we could have this discussion. There's so many interesting things in uh, in reproductive fluid mechanics, and so what I'm going to focus on today is uh, you know here are the ingredients. Uh, motile sperm, muscular contraction, ciliary beating, and so forth. I, um, I'm going to concentrate today on, on sperm motility. So I'm going to give you a tour of some things that we've been uh, thinking about here at Tulane and other mm -hmm. people also have been thinking about. And um, I figured I would um, look at two things, uh, two things that, re that, that relate to um, reproductive biomechanics and that's sperm motility and, and also modeling a more complex fluid environment, viscoelastic networks. And then I want to, uh, I'm motivated by, uh, by reproduction, but I want to tell you something just in general about flexible fibers in flow. So here are some, uh, here, here's one, uh, one story that I want to tell you. Mm -hmm. So this, these are images of mammalian sperm, a mouse sperm and a bull sperm that during what, what, you, what you normally think about as just regular sperm motility, you, you think about these guys as undergoing a symmetric beat about a center line that looks like a, a traveling sine wave. And so here, there you see this movie from Susan Suarez's lab where this sperm is just you know, moving symmetric feet up and down or right and left. And it's, um, it's, it's uh, swimming in more or less a straight line. Mm -hmm. now, now I'm gonna show you something mm -hmm. that's a different type of motility called hyperactivated motility. And this guy looks pretty confused. Uh -huh. He's going around in a circle. Uh -huh. So what's happening here? This, the, there, there, are, uh, there are experiments that show that if you knock out the receptors that enable this kind of motility, the mouse uh, is infertile. Mm -hmm. So there is a point, and, and this, the, bio, bio, uh, the biochemistry of this change has been well studied. So why are these sperm doing, when are they doing this and why are they doing that? And so, so this type of, of, of motility where the waveform is highly asymmetrical and, 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 and very deep bends occurs once, uh, let, me, let me go back here to this picture. It occurs sometime in here before the sperm gets close to the egg. So what I didn't tell you is that when sperm enter the oviduct, most, many of them, their cell bodies adhere to the epithelium. They get stuck or they hang out there for a while. Maybe they're not, may, maybe, maybe the egg isn't ready to be, uh, to, to be fertilized yet, but the sperm gets stuck. Mm -hmm. 
So the, the thought is, is that this very vigorous waveform that's asymmetric mm. is generating the right force to pull their heads off of the, the oviduct. That's one idea. Mm. Another idea is that, that as that, that hyperactivated waveform is happening near where they're supposed to fertilize the egg and they have to penetrate a viscoelastic shell that maybe that allows penetration. So th those are the, the wow. you know, that's per perhaps that is um, why that's happening. And I, uh, when I give this talk, I, I, I give this anecdote that for a long time, I guess this was probably, uh, I started working with Susan in the, you know, I don't know, 2011, 12. So it's quite a, a long time ago. I had never included any biochemistry in my modeling, I always just looked at mechanics. Mm -hmm. And it opened my eyes very uh, widely when we went to her lab and she showed us a, some fresh sperm in a, in a, a micro slide that, and they were swimming like this. And instantaneously, she, um, uh, she put some chemical in there. I think the maricide, I, I don't remember what it was. And, all, and that, that sperm all, all of a sudden went crazy and was going round and round. So it, it wasn't gradual. And so when I say the biochemistry of this change is fairly well characterized, they know what particular um, way of treating the flagellum chemically to open up these channels and allow great influ influx of calcium. Mm -hmm. So, where does the fluid mechanics come in? So, what, where does it come in? Obviously the sperm is, is moving in a, in a fluid. And so for now, I'm going to assume that we have Newtonian fluid mechanics, the Navier-Stokes equations, and we want to solve, so the Navier-Stokes equations are just mass times acceleration equal applied forces, pressure, viscosity, and an external force. Mm -hmm. And divergence of U is zero is um, incompressibility, right? So, so this is the this is this is a simplifying assumption that the fl uh, that the motion the flow is Newtonian. But when you non-dimensionalize and uh, you you non-dimensionalize space and time, and by an, by a characteristic length and characteristic velocity, you get the well-known. Reynolds number that comes and sits in front of this acceleration term. And at what, if we're considering sperm motility, the Reynolds number at that level uh, with, for those length and velocity scales are about 10, 10 to the minus two, more or less. So we take the Reynolds number limit going to zero and we end up with the Stokes equations. And so these are, if we're trying to model um, flow at the micro scale, uh, at the scale of, of, of say sperm, we're solving this system where the forces, and this is a funny equation, right? Because we have no, time disappears. At every instant, our forces are in complete equilibrium. Pressure forces, viscous forces, and whatever external force are in, are in total balance at every moment. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're going to follow, I know some of you, especially, uh, you know, I know Sook and, and everyone in our family have heard about immersed boundary methods where we represent elastic structures as a, a force on the fluid. Mm -hmm. And so the methodology that I'm gonna look at is, is, uh, is in the spirit of immersed boundary method. Uh, so just leave that for a second. But step back as uh, in, in computational fluid dynamics in biology, I think everyone should, before you start on a problem, we should ask a few questions. We understand that something's moving around in a fluid, great. Are we going to go and bring out the big guns and do full-scale Navier-Stokes solvers or full-scale Stokes solvers? Let's ask the questions. What, do, what is it that we wanna learn? Mm -hmm. Let's think about what the complications are and then make some modeling choices. I see. Okay. So I'm gonna look at that in the context of this story that I just showed you. Mm -hmm. 
So when we started this project, and I guess I started this project, some of you know Sarah Olson, who um, also collaborates with Sook. We said, well, going from this regular sperm motility to this crazy circular motility, we can ask the questions, what are the biochemical pathways that actually initiate this change in, uh, that actually initiate this, this new uh, cycle? Then we could ask the question, how do these biochemical signals actually govern the mechanics? So what's causing that sperm to actually uh, actually propagate a wave and how is that, how are the mechanics at the microscale level changing? Then we could ask, uh, we could ask another equation, uh, another equation, another question saying, okay, forget where it comes from and why hyperactivation is initiated. Forget what is happening internally to have that happen. If we have these waveforms, what are the hydrodynamic implications of it? Does it really generate more force to pull itself off of being stuck? So these are different levels of, of questions. I highlighted in blue the questions that um, our group looked at. So I won't talk about here, but we did include some biochemical signaling in our models. The second question, of uh, how these biochemical signals are changing the, um, the, the duty cycle of these molecular motors, these dynines that act on microtubules is a very interesting question. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that anyone has done modeling of mm. hyperactivated internal force generating models per se. So here's the questions that uh, we're highlighting, and if you're thinking about this as just starting, you know a little bit about modeling in in uh, computational fluids. What what is why is this a complicated problem? Uh, well, the interface is for me the interface is the flagellum. They're moving. They're complicated geometries, and not for a single flagellum, but if we were studying multiple sperm moving through the reproductive tract, there are many interfaces. These flagellum the, or these interfaces, they're, actu they're flexible, they're elastic, they're actuated. What does that mean? There's something in there like molecular motors that are driving them to, to change their shape. I already mentioned that the fluid itself uh, for part of the site, uh, part of the reproductive part of the reproductive tract in the female is there's it's the fluid is definitely non-Newtonian cervical mucus right definitely non-Newtonian and we might want to capture biochemical signaling mm -hmm. well so what modeling choices do we make well do we do we do a 2d model versus a 3d that sperm beat that flagellar beating looks like it's occurring in a plane but even if you have a planar even if you have a planar waveform, there's fluid all around it in 3D. So do, do, do we do 2D versus 3D? Do we, um, do we model the intricacies of the overduct or do we just assume that the sperm is swimming in a, in a periodic box? Do we, do we look at, uh, we, we understand that sperm are swimming in close proximity to other sperm, but do we start with one? Do we say, okay, like in this, um, like in this hyperactivated uh, swimmer with this asymmetric beat, do we assume that we, uh, do, do we specify the kinematics of the shape and then look at the surrounding flow field? Or instead, do we say, well, let's, we, will, the, will the flagellum be flexible and have its shape evolve from the full system. So these are the kind of modeling questions that, that we ask, but it's, it's important to know what choices you're making, right? Whenever you start, so starting, I'm, I'm preaching now a little bit, it's, um, I'm sorry for that, but for the young, younger folk, I mean, this has not just to do with biofluids, it has to do with whatever, you know, whatever network models you're looking at. What question do you want to answer? What makes it so complicated? Make some simplifying assumptions. Okay. 
So in, in this case, um, I'm going to show you where we took this, this flagellum, we're ignoring a cell body, and we, we, we want to, we, we, we are choosing it to be an Euler elastica. So it's, go, it's, it's parameterized by S and its shape X of, at time T is given by this. And we say that it's gonna be driven by two types of energy, a tensile energy that holds it together. And it's also going to be uh, driven by uh, some preferred curvature function that we are going to specify and this preferred and this uh, this preferred curvature will be informed by some chemical or some calcium signaling along the flagellum. So for now, so I'm not, I'm not going to go over that, but I'm saying that suppose that we know at a particular Lagrangian point S on the flagellum at a time t, we want the curvature to be some, we, we're gonna specify a preferred curvature that this filament is going to be in pursuit of. The energy, the bending energy would be minimized when the curvature is equal to this preferred curvature. Mm -hmm. How strongly the evolving curvature follows this preferred curvature that we're, that we're specifying will depend on this stiffness constant. You could think of this as a bending rigidity. So if we write down an energy, mm -hmm. a tensile energy, we definitely want this thing to be almost inextensible. Mm -hmm. uh, so that this, this, the tensile energy would be zero when, the, when, when this is uh, inextensible. Mm -hmm. But this bending energy is evolving in time due to something that we're specifying. And, by, and, and we could think about these constants here as some kind of bending uh, rigidity. And so we have to impart forces from this energy. So the forces are the derivatives minus the derivatives of this energy. And we need to impart this to the surrounding fluid. So all I'm telling you on this slide is that that preferred curvature that we're specifying for this um, hyperactivated waveform is something that is uh, informed by calcium dynamics. So the methodology that we use is to take these forces on the flagellum. Mm -hmm. We discretize the flagellum. These forces are the derivatives of that energy function, these FKs. And we're, 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 we're saying that these forces at the discrete points on the flagellum X of K are going to be Dirac delta function forces. Mm -hmm. So here's the Stokes equations with a collection, a finite collection of forces. Mm -hmm. We still have incompressibility. Right. This is still a, this is a linear equation in velocity, but this system is nonlinear, and I'll show you why it's interesting. Because we don't know where these particles or these, these nodes along the flagellum are going to end up. We're going to make them move here at the local fluid velocity. So given these forces, we wanna solve for the velocities at those points and then update the positions. On top of it, these forces, think about these as hooky and spring forces for tensile energy or these bending forces for the bending energy, they depend on the evolving configuration. Now, here, because this equation is linear, if we know the solution of the Stokes equations for a single delta function force, then we just sum up those, those solutions. And that is the, the Stokes solution. And I didn't write it out, but th this is a classic, a cl classical applied math, classical fluid dynamics. It, you, get, you can write down analytically the fundamental solution for the Stokes equations in all of three space. What we do instead, and this makes it a, a, a numerical method, is we, we regularize the force a bit so instead of thinking about having a sum of delta function forces, we have a, uh, we we use 
uh, blob functions or smeared out delta functions where, where, the, where uh, epsilon is a regularization parameter. Mm -hmm. And this was my colleague Ricardo Cortez's uh, idea 20 years ago. It was a good idea. We're still using this because just this, you can write for a regularized delta function or a regularized blob function, you could find an analytic solution to this equation and you get a regularized Stokeslet, which then is easy, easily implemented in a numerical method. And so we've had lots of undergraduates over the years work on coding this kind of thing up because it's, it's, it's a, a simple idea that given forces, we could compute velocities at the points where we're given forces and update the system. And so, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go through the numerical method here because in the time I have left, I wanna show you some, some more simulations. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, here are, I, the, the, here are the three different simulations of a single uh, sperm. The blue one is, um, the regular, uh, the regular symmetric beat form. The black one, we're specifying the curvature that there's some asymmetry. And the red one is coupled to calcium mechanics. And you see that this uh, hyperactivated form does emerge and you see the swimming trajectories. So what choices did we make here? Well, here we chose that the beat was going to be planar, but we were going to solve the 3D Stokes equations. We did not specify the kinematics. We gave these curves some preferred kinematics that was evolving from the calcium model. Okay, so these, you know, this, but, but they remain, we, we, we had these waveforms remain in the plane. Okay. So you just, so here we were just mimicking what the waveforms look like. But let's see what happens. What we, what we did next was a series of um, simulations where now instead of having them swimming in unbounded space, we put a planar wall in. Um, and so I, I'm not showing you movies, but here's the red case, the symmetric case, uh, not the red case, the black case, the blue case, and the evolving case where they were swimming towards a wall with zero velocity uh, boundary condition. Mm -hmm. These are different snapshots in time. What I'm showing you here, so there's six different snapshots in time. And you see that this flexible flagellum, its shape is definitely, um, it's influenced by the proximity of the wall. Mm -hmm. um, so what's happening here is that the, uh, the hyperactivated one, what, as it gets towards the wall, it never escapes. You know, it's swimming towards the wall and it's doing all of this stuff and it just gets sucked into the wall. So in conversations with Susan Suarez, the experimentalist, she told us that when they, when they look at uh, preparations in, in, the, in the mice oviduct, when sperm get to the wall, they're not exactly sticking. Their cell body doesn't come and stick to the actual wall. It comes nearby. There are cilia, and there's and and the cell body get, gets kind of stuck on the cilia that moves around. Mm -hmm. So there, so it's so we we decided to model instead uh, of of this flagellum that when it got, when the cell body, there's no cell body, but there's a tip. When it got close enough to the wall, we created an elastic bond, like a protein bond that had a, a rest length that was non-zero. So when it got close enough, we saw in the simulation, we would say, okay, you know what? We're going to create a force as if there is a spring there and give that spring certain properties. So we're not allowing the, the head to get exactly to the no slip wall, but close by and we'll create a, a bond. And then that bond in response to the flow could either stretch or compress. And then we had some rules for bond breaking. 
that if it got stretched beyond a certain amount, we would break that bond. Mm -hmm. And so I'm showing you those simulations in the previous still here where there was no bond. And they're all kind of, it, it, you, you see that there's rotation near the wall. They're not, their tails aren't going across the wall, um, take my word for it, um, but they don't escape. Mm -hmm. But now in these next two uh, simulations, you see, you can't really, the, 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 those bonds are very small. You can't really see them, but they're there. Um, and we have different uh, attachment rules and I'll show you this last one. But you see in that, in that second, in the middle frame, the hyperactivated guy, he did escape. And then he gets back and gets attached again, but periodically attaches and escapes, which is exactly what, what they were finding in experiments. Right. So what we found was, you know, just, this is uh, just a, stor a story that, yeah, that we found that once we added these elastic bond behaviors, this dynamic behavior, we were able to, to see the same frequent binding and, and uh, binding, attaching and detaching uh, that they saw in the experiments. And it's counterintuitive, but the elastic bond behavior actually enabled the sperm to move away from the epithelium. Uh, that's just a close up of the simulations. I, I, um, Julie Simons was the postdoc who was uh, in charge of this project. Pretty, it's pretty cool. And one of them finally disappears, I think. Oh, okay, uh, was there any question there? I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay. Super good, yeah. Okay. Well, Lisa? Yeah. Is uh, is it uh, so the head of the uh, sperm um, cell? There's no role. You don't. Uh, so head head the body is not important in this dynamics at all. Probably it is, but we ignored one. So mm -hmm. this is not like bacteria at all because there's no counter rotation. You mm -hmm. could a sperm cell, unlike a bacteria. Lisa, we couldn't hear your answer. <laughs> it was oh. it got disconnected. Oh, okay, you... can you hear me now? Yes, yes, it works okay. now. Okay, sorry. So um, uh, for a sperm cell, if you cut the head off, it will still swim, unlike a bacteria. Because ah, the motors are all along the flagellum. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying, I'm, I'm sure the dynamics, the fluid dynamics, local fluid dynamics would change depending upon the cell body. Mm -hmm. But um, we don't, didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now uh, here's another short story. Mm -hmm. uh, so most sperm here, not, there's a part of in their in their trajectory through the through the female reproductive tract where they are certainly not swimming through uh, fluid like water. So here's an image where you see this you see the sperm head right here. And I think this is, um, I, I think this is cervical mucus. I'm not sure, this is a, a bull. So you see that the voids in this polymeric structure mm -hmm. are on the same order as the size of the cell body. Mm -hmm. So in um, microorganism motility and probably, you know, around 2006 or so, it became really, uh, the, all the, the, the biofluids folks decided to take all the classical fluid dynamic problems like swimming, swimming microorganism, peristaltic pumping and so forth. And let's see if we, what happens when we make the fluid complex. Right. Okay. And so um, I played that game a little bit then, but what I'm really interested in is this heterogeneous uh, structure. So, so is this structure is very rigid or very flexible. It's compliant, right? I mean, here this is a this is a, what is that called? A scanning electron micrograph. So it looks it, so it's compliant, right? These polymers are. Oh, I see. Moving. They're 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 maybe they're stuck. Maybe they're moving. Happens in many different uh, ways. So what? And, and, and so now I'm, uh, this, has, this is not reproduction, but this is uh, just an other microorganisms which I'm interested in right now. And uh, they also move through uh, complex 
uh, mucosal tissues or polymeric networks. So this is an image from a colleague at Tulane at the Primate Center where they study um, they study lots of diseases, including uh, Lyme disease, which is known to be caused by spirochetes, which are like uh, which are a type of bacteria. And this is after uh, an infected monkey's uh, heart was, you know, after they were dead. This is the heart tissue, and there's actually an intact uh, bacteria that had penetrated through to the heart tissue. Um, so. So uh, for bacteria, for, for sure, this is a, a, a problem. Uh, one other uh, bacteria that has become pretty famous in the last 20 years is H. pylori, which has been known, which causes ulcers. And, um, and this bacteria actually can, uh, it, 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 in, in, the, in, in the, your stomach or so forth, it could penetrate the mucus barrier. And how does it do that? Uh, it could actually, it secretes an enzyme that kind of dissolves that mucus barrier. And so that's what makes it kind of nasty. So it's not only moving through a polymeric environment, it's remodeling that environment mm -hmm. by, uh, by an enzyme. And so in this paper by Walker et al, they're actually trying to engineer robotic little nanorobot microbes that actually spit out could actually have some of these enzymes that could so it could also screw through mucosal tissue but the good the good news is they want to use this for drug delivery to to, to penetrate tumors so they're, so they're they're trying to use for these nanorobots they're using ideas from from the h pylori mm -hmm. okay so um the strategy, and um, there's this not the first time uh, this strategy has been taken, is to take a Newtonian fluid and then take an elastic network and embed it on in that Newtonian fluid by appropriate distribution of forces. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is, you know, just people. So within the context of regularized Stokes slit or immersed boundary methods. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I will show you. So right now, uh, Ricardo and I are working with our postdoc, Rudy Shook, mm -hmm. on helical bacteria swimming through, through this network. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a bunch of nodes and connect them by these simple elements, by either Hookian springs or Stokes, uh, or Hookian, a spring with a dash pot, and then get something like this structure. So here there's no organism right now. Mm -hmm. And this is work uh, from a few years ago with Yatsik Robo. We created these polymeric networks and we performed computational rheology tests to, to try to characterize our viscoelastic fluid much like it's done in the lab. And so for these regular networks that I'm showing here or more perturbed networks, we were able to show that these were behaving like viscoelastic fluids. Um, but the fun part is to swim things through these networks. So this is um, a few years ago. And here, this is, this is a, a planar flagellar beat. So this is supposed to be like a, a sperm. The choice that we made here, unlike the hyperactivated simulations that I showed you, is we chose to specify the kinematics. There were no preferred curvature. These guys were gonna swim with that particular geometry no matter what. Wow. So, we, so that was a different thing. We specified velocities, how to solve for forces. So this is a choice in the model. So presumably, and we've not done this yet, uh, presumably once this guy was swimming in Newtonian fluid and then it faces this cube of jello, mm -hmm. presumably it might, it might not be able to maintain that uh, amplitude. But we did not include that in this here. So what, so what I want you to look at here, and the difference between these networks is that there are more springs in this network uh, here. Mm -hmm. What I want you to look at here 
is the swimming velocity. And the swimming velocity is normalized by the swimming velocity it would have achieved in Newtonian case. So as it approaches this mesh, it's going slower than one. This is less than one. But as it's leaving, it gets a boost. It actually gets, um, it swims faster than it would have been if it was in Newtonian. And our explanation for this is that it is getting some of the potential energy from the springs as it comes out. So there's stored potential energy in these, uh, this, this network of springs as it's pushing itself out. So, and that's what I'm just showing you here again. Uh -huh. So this is a case of a, of a sperm flagellum. Mm -hmm. what, we want, what we want to do is, uh, you know, is, is to try to understand sperm egg penetration, but I just, I don't have much time uh, left. So I, I, I just want to show you what we're thinking about now. And so I'm, I apologize that this isn't reproduction, but we're doing the same thing here uh, with Rudy. And instead of having a specified planar wave, you, this, this is actually a three-dimensional mm -hmm. object, mm -hmm. a three-dimensional cell body, mm -hmm. and a three-dimensional helical tail that, and the two are counter-rotating. And what we're specifying here is the torque between the two. So, um, and here, this is just, this is going through, this is not going through that network. This is just passive tracers. So this swimmer is in Stokes flow. Mm. But now let's see what happens where we take this. Again, this is 3D, you're seeing two dimensional slice mm -hmm. and we swim this through a stiff network with hooky and springs. And what I want you to, uh, you can see it coming out at you on the, on the right. The curve I want you to look at on the bottom is, the, is, this, is this dark blue. That again is the swimming velocity compared to the Stokesian swimming velocity. So it's less than one as it's moving through this mesh. It's dragging some of it. It's swimming more slowly than than Newtonian, but as it leaves, it, it gets a little boost. And the, and the dashed blue curve is the efficiency. Um, the bottom graph is showing the potential energy. Mm -hmm. So it is pretty interesting that recently there was a paper that appeared in Nature Communications where, where folks were looking at studies of, uh, of, of actual bacteria moving through conduits. And when they, when they, they showed that little boost in energy um, in real things that uh, the boost in swimming speed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's take this and instead let's change the material property of this springs. We're going to make these springs non hooky and we're going to add a dash pot. So a dash pot is as you stretch the spring a little bit, as it stretches, it rests, its rest length stretches a little. That's what it so now we take the same thing and we swim it through. It doesn't look much different, but here, this is, these are Maxwell elements. And so um, it's hard to discern the difference, but I will, uh, I, I should speed this up, but, you know, but here is giving you the idea that this guy's moving through some junk, it is in it. And uh, it does get a, a little boost at the end. But what I really want to show you is what we're, we're playing with now is we want to study how the cell can actually look, look it's, it's dragging some of the mesh with it. So I should say what we do is we do not allow nodes from the mesh to penetrate the head. Mm -hmm. So if, if there is, so we, we allow this network as it's pushing this link, we only allow tangential, uh, we, on, we on, only allow the nodes in the springs to go tangential to the head. So we put in some kind of um, repulsion. But what I wanna show you here is now, it's like that H. pylori or like those robots. We are actually remodeling the network as we move through it. So we have some threshold 
that says, as the cell body, when it approaches links, it's going to turn off, turn them off, turn their stiffnesses off. And so here, maybe this is no surprise, but this guy uh, uh, bored a, a hole through the network um, as it swam through. So, you know, here are the, the three simulations that I showed you all have the same stiffness. They have um, one, the top one is Hookian. The Hookian one went faster. So the, I stopped this at time two. two. The Hookian went, guy went further than the one with the Maxwell elements, which is a little counterintuitive to me, maybe. Mm -hmm. But this is a gushier, a floppier mesh. So it was probably, we, we know that these bacteria are, are pushers. I'm telling you this to Sook, she, she, I, if you don't know what I mean. Um, it brings by the tail, it pushes stuff towards it. And so if this mesh is floppier, it was bringing more of the mesh in towards the tail, which was hindering motion. But all the way down here, even though this motion is hindered, in this last case where we were allowing the enzyme to dissolve the mesh, um, he got pretty far. So there's a lot more to be uh, looked at here, how all of this depends upon material parameters, the dynamics of dissolution or dissolving the mesh. And um, we could also, and we have done experiments where we, we break links when they're stretched beyond a certain amount. And uh, I, I will have to tell you about that another time. Mm -hmm. So I, am, I, I wanna show you some more simulations just because it's getting late here and these are very cool, but it's all, all <laughs> for most of you, it's daytime, so you're still awake. Yeah. Um, so getting back, and again, this is not really reproduction, but it's the kind of things we're thinking about lately. So flagella, like I showed you, the, 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 the last helical swimmer that I showed you and the, the ones in the mesh, those were not flexible. The original hyperactivated flagellum had some kind of flexibility. They had bending rigidity. So, in other projects, we were interested in looking at just flexible, non-actuated fibers in shear or background flows. Um, let's see. And this kind of thing, understanding how passive fibers move in shear flow, for instance, how, what kind of orbits they take is, is a long history. And this is a paper from 1958 from, a, from somebody who was at a Pulp and Paper Research Institute of Canada to mm -hmm. study uh, how fibers move in flow because uh, this is really an interest to chemical engineers for these kind of composite uh, for making paper. Mm -hmm. More recently uh, with the, um, at, and this is uh, some, from a group of collaborators and this was Yan on Liu's thesis in, in Paris one with uh, current technology, you could you could take actin filaments from cells and look at their dynamics in microfluidic devices. And so um, there's work by uh, by this group here studying the dynamics of these fibers in shear flow and the different types of buckling behavior mm -hmm. that occurs. So um, in we, we try to look at building these kind of fibers that have the resolution where we could um, mimic these kind of complex buckling behavior. So these are three different experiments and the only thing that's different is the length. But the length um, you know, comes into play in this, in this non-dimensional elastoviscous number that tells you when the buckling occurs. So I'm just showing you pictures right now and I'm, I'm, I'm just about done, um, but I'm showing you an example of a simulation that we're doing where it's a very long fiber in shear. And uh, I should tell you that the only way that we got to, to these calculations with enough resolution was we're using a kernel independent fast multipole method uh, within regularized Stokeslits. 
but I, I particularly, because this is a very lovely um, simulation, if, even if I say so myself, I like looking at it. But what am I showing you in the top corner here? In that paper from 1958 with the pulp fibers and the nylon fibers, uh -huh. they were unable to take pictures of the experiments of the very long fibers. So they did a sketch, <laughs> a drawing of, of what they saw, wow. which pretty much looks exactly like this spaghetti. Wow. Okay. So, um, Finally, we, we were looking at some other experiments out, and this is in collaboration with uh, the group in Paris of the filaments, not in shear flow, but in straining flow. So I just want you to look at this picture up here. This is a microfluidic device. There's a flow imposed, so a fixed flow rate. So of course, as the flow goes through this constriction, it has to, it has to uh, accelerate. It's faster flow because of incompressibility and then the flow slows down. Mm -hmm. So what um, the group, what Yanon did in her thesis was to put actin fibers in here. And so as, as they go through this constricted region, they, there's an extens, extension, but then as they go into the expanded region, they get compressed. And so this is the actual actin filaments and, and a, a big deal with this experiment is that she was able to move the stage of the microscope to follow that fiber. And what you're seeing here is as that fiber moves through, it gets elongated as it goes through the faster, the place where there's faster flow, there's where it gets stretched and elongated and then Boom, you 